hello good morning good afternoon good evening from for from all participants um including the panelists and the audience um, who are joining us from various parts of the world thank you for joining with us today thank you to all the co-hosts of this event uh, the canadian tamil congress uh, the Sri Lanka Campaign for Peace and Just, uh, Justice, the Department of Center for Human Rights and Global Justice, New York School of Law, New York University. Thank you to all the distinguished panelists, especially the ones who have joined from Sri Lanka, um, at, uh, who might be at some kind of risk of intimidation. Thank you to all the distinguished uh, international experts who have who have had previous relationship with Sri Lanka in their capacity of different offices. Without uh, further delay, may I hand you, hand you over to our moderator, Melissa, who is the campaign director of Sri Lanka Campaign for Peace and Justice, who are one of the co-hosts. Take it away, Melissa. Thank you, Soren, um, and thank you to Global Tamil Forum, the Canadian Tamil Congress, and the Centre for Human Rights and, and Global Justice at New York University, who are our co-sponsors for this event. Um, and thank you to all of you in the audience who are joining us today for um, this very important event to discuss human rights and transitional justice in Sri Lanka. Um, this is a critical time for these issues. Um, as the High Commissioner for Human Rights has flagged in her recent report, uh, there are early warning signs and heightened risk of future violations um, within Sri Lanka, enabled by impunity um, and the undermining of the rule of law and democratic rights. Um, but you're not here to hear from me, you're here to hear from our panellists. Uh, we have two hours for this event today. Um, first, we will have presentations from each of our panellists, and then we will open into a panel discussion, followed by a Q&A session, um, taking questions from you, our audience. If you have questions for our panelists today, please email them to info at canadiantamilcongress.ca. Um, you should see the, the email address on the screen and uh, in the comments uh, on the section. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass this over to our first presenter. Um, Charles Petrie is a former UN Assistant Secretary General with close to 30 years experience working in contexts of conflict and famine. And he resigned from the United Nations in part as a result of his inability to get the organization to investigate one of its own who had participated in the crime of genocide. In March 2012, Charles Petrie was designated by the UN Secretary General to lead an internal re review of the UN's actions in Sri Lanka during the last phase of the conflict. The report was submitted to the Secretary General in early November of that year and served as a basis for the elaboration of the Secretary General's rights up front policy a policy that places protection at the forefront of all UN action. Charles Petrie continues to be involved in Myanmar, serving as an advisor to the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And Charles is going to speak to us today about the UN and its commitment to human rights in Sri Lanka. Over to you, Charles. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Sorry. Uh, just, sorry, just one minute trying to get everything together. Yeah, so th thank you. So, so democracy and rule of law have entered dangerous uncharted waters in Sri Lanka. Since, in, since its independence, Sri Lanka has experienced three waves, waves of violence, but the country has never dealt with its past. Communities have never been given an opportunity to come to terms with their suffering, and those responsible have, with very few exceptions, been held to account. When in 2015, Sri Lanka co-sponsored and signed the U UN Human Rights Council resolution, there was a moment of hope that the newly elected government would not only support international transitional justice efforts, but would even attempt to put in place similar local mechanisms. But this optimism was short-lived, in part because of the government's non-implementation of what had been initially promised, but more importantly, following the elections in 2020, of a government following the election in 2020, of a government believing it had received a clear populist Sinhalese Buddhist mandate encouraging it in its exclusionary policies. There are well-founded fears that Sri Lanka's democratic system is now under threat. Sri Lanka today faces a dangerous mix of political and social forces. The spread of COVID and the fear and suspicion it brings. A deteriorating economy crippled by 
COVID and debt and heading towards sovereign default or a painful international bailout. The authoritarian concentration of power in the presidency, aided by rapid militarization of civil administration and the active cultivation of anti-minority sentiments, particularly against the Muslims. Together, these have, begun, these have begun to produce anger and instability, to which traditionally the state has never hesitated to respond with violence and repression. The country has begun to travel down a dangerous path that could spark instability that would bring Sri Lanka and its international partners much greater difficulties later on. Sri Lanka's problems can't be solved by the UN or our other outside powers. The drive and commitment to come to terms with a painful past and to address the dangerous divisions and tensions of today need to come from within the country and an enlightened leadership must show the direction. Such leadership seems to currently be lacking. Once more, Sri Lanka presents the question of the seriousness and effectiveness of the UN's commitment to fulfilling its human rights mandate. As was already mentioned, I led the internal investigation of the UN's performance at the end of the Sri Lankan Civil War. The review highlighted the systemic nature of the organization's inability to fully assume its protection responsibilities. The Secretary General at the time, Ban Ki-moon, accepted the damning conclusions of the report and introduced a policy that placed human rights and protection at the forefront of UN action. But the policy as it was articulated then did not survive the transition into the new Secretary General's tenure. It was in part defeated by the emergence of a Darwinian type of new world order with various forms of nationalism taking on more central roles in defining international relations. But the issue remained on the Secretary General's agenda. In early 2019, the Secretary General con commissioned a confidential review of how to strengthen the organizational culture in support of human rights. The review found that there continued to be a lack of commitment by senior leadership to addressing human rights concern. The review concluded that there was an urgent need for clear internal communication on the importance of safeguarding UN values and upholding human rights. There, that there was a need to provide better incentive structures for strong leadership, which included accountability for inaction on human rights. And finally, the need to equip staff with required knowledge and skills to champion human rights across the organization. In line with the aforementioned stated intentions, another significant con contribution to the UN's commitment to try to operate in complex situations has come out of the Secretary General's 2017 reform agenda. The reform has three components to it, peace and security, development and management. The development component of the reform agenda entailed detaching the resident coordinator position from its agency responsibility, in this case UNDP, and linking the position directly to the Deputy Secretary General and tasking the mandate of the position to the accomplishment of the Sustainable Development Goals. The freeing of the UN in-country representative from any agency responsibility and linking the position directly to the Deputy Secretary General through the newly created Development Coordination Office, in theory increases the capacity of the position to convene and coordinate a UN system-wide response, which would include now the Bretton Woods institutions. Basing the RC's mandate on the accomplishments of the SDGs should also help to depoliticize the position while still retaining its ability to address questions of governance and protection. And so, it is almost undeniable that today there is a greater awareness in the UN of the importance of its protection responsibilities. Over the last year, high-level meetings on Sri Lanka, some even chaired by the UN Secretary General, have underscored the UN's commitment to its protection mandate. Understanding, understandings have been reached on the importance of calibrating messaging from in-country and headquarters structures in New York and Geneva, that assert the basic UN principles. Critical importance has been given to developing a comprehensive UN strategy that would allow for engagement with the government, provide services to the people, and firmly assert UN principles relating to human rights, social cohesion, non-discrimination, and transitional justice. Unfortunately, these good, good intentions have yet to result in concrete action. 
The ability and willingness of the UN to promote a coherent approach towards fulfilling its mandates as ascribed to it by its charter is frustrated by internal rivalries and the lack of an overall commitment to ensure system-wide compliance. The UN today as an entity continues to be dysfunctional in its approach to dealing with the emergence of serious human rights abuses and threats. It's not a question of the UN not having the tools and mechanisms to do so, but rather lacking the will and courage to use them effectively. Sri Lanka's challenges today are fundamentally political and human rights in nature. The UN's relevance in Sri Lanka has to be directly linked to the upholding of its founding principles as articulated in its charter, a charter to which all of the General Assembly men member states have subscribed. This means that the leadership, the UN leadership must find the courage to prioritize principled approaches over political calculations and programmatic engagement. To have a meaningful impact in Sri Lanka, the whole of the UN system needs to work in step as one to promote its values. Will it do so? Only time and history will tell. In the immediate though, in the immediate though I would urge those in greatest need not to count on the UN being able to live up to its responsibility towards we the people. Not counting on the organization to live, to live up to the UN Charter of which we the people is the preamble will avoid major disappointments and unnecessary suffering. But were I to pre be proven wrong, then the world will have become a much better place. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Charles. And our next speaker is Pablo de Grief who is currently Senior Fellow and Director of the Transitional Justice Programme at the Centre for Human Rights and Global Justice at the School of Law at NYU. Prior to joining NYU, he was the Director of Research at the International Centre for Transitional Justice from 2001 to 2014. In 2011, the UN Human Rights Council established a mandate for a special rapporteur on the promotion of truth, justice, reparation and guarantees of non-recurrence. And at the 19th session, HRC session on 23rd of March 2012, De Grief was appointed to the post. As special rapporteur, De Grief has visited Sri Lanka at least four times during 2015 to 2019. He has also provided advice to a wide range of governments, the UN and non-governmental organisations, particularly victims' organisations, truth commissions and multilateral institutions in the area of transitional justice, gender issues and the linkages between justice security and development. And Pablo will speak to us today about monitoring international action on accountability. Pablo. Uh, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Melissa. And uh, I have to say it's uh, an honor for the Center for Human Rights and uh, Global Justice uh, at NYU, of which I am a member, to co-host uh, this event. And it is uh, particularly an honor to share the event uh, with uh, both uh, the Sri Lankan experts and the international experts. I also have to express uh, at the outset uh, my agreement uh, with the very compelling intervention that uh, Charles uh, just made. And um, also to say that uh, in that respect, it's a hard act uh, to follow. I would like to make uh, some uh, general interventions in the brief time uh, that uh, I have. Uh, we are here in part because of the continuation of uh, a long history on the part of Sri Lanka of what uh, a very good scholar has called quasi-compliance with uh, obligations. And of course, I want to clarify that quasi-compliance is not a kind of compliance but a kind of non-compliance. I also want to say that the relevant obligations that we are talking about here, although often called uh, international obligations, 
uh, it is important to think uh, that international law doesn't hover mysteriously above uh, nation states, but that it is actually the reflection of commitments voluntarily undertaken by the states that form the international community and that as a consequence give shape to those international obligations. Sri Lanka is a signatory to all the major human rights instruments as uh, Charles mentioned, it is, of course, a part of the General Assembly and, as such, accepts uh, the obligations contained in the Charter of the United Nations. But the crucial point is that, ultimately, these are obligations that Sri Lanka has, not just to the international community, but primarily to its own citizens. So the history of non-compliance with obligations, it's a history that should not be thought of primarily as a history of failure to the international community, but as a history of failure to Sri Lankans' own citizens. And to delve into a few of the details of that history, it is a history that, of course, includes both intra as well as intercommunity violence. And it is a history that, as Charles also mentioned, includes periodic cycles of violence. And uh, therefore, I think that it is a huge mistake to reduce the transitional justice and the accountability project and the human rights project more broadly as uh, if it concerned only one period in Sri Lanka's uh, history, namely the period around uh, the end uh, of the conflict uh, around uh, 2009. The accountability project, the transitional justice project, and more broadly, the human rights uh, project is one that should be used in order to analyze the long history of uh, Sri Lanka that uh, includes these periodic uh, cycles of violence uh, that uh, we have mentioned. And those cycles of violence, in a certain sense, uh, are uh, now very well understood, not just uh, regarding Sri Lanka, but uh, globally. There is a very robust uh, correlation between uh, unredressed uh, human rights violations and uh, the occurrence of violence uh, in the future. So although social science is not a predictive, exact predictive science as such as physics, we now know enough to understand what are the factors that greatly increase the probability of violence and violations in the future. And this is why we are so concerned about the state of Sri Lanka today. The problem with the, the transitional project, the accountability project, and more broadly, the human rights project in Sri Lanka, in my experience during the visits that I made in the period following 2015, was that it wasn't taken sufficiently seriously by crucial sectors of Sri Lankan society. It was taken quite seriously by some sectors of uh, civil society and, for instance, uh, the work uh, of the consultation task force, now almost willfully forgotten by the current government uh, and by sectors including of the previous government. I think it's an example of progress that uh, Sri Lanka made uh, during that period. There was also progress in some sectors of the previous government, for example, as expressed in the creation and the work of the Secretariat for the Coordination of Reconciliation Mechanisms, now disbanded 
uh, and uh, the tasks left uh, abandoned. But the problem is that despite those signs of progress, the project overall had no big sponsors. It would have required very strong leadership on the part of the president, the prime minister and high government officials. But it would also have required some clear perceptions of generalized interests on the part of civil society. So there was much that could have been done both institutionally and in terms of civil society to give life to that project, which if it had been done, we would not have the concerns that we have today. I mentioned in the report that was eventually presented to the council some of the crucial elements that could have prevented us from getting to where we are today and that would prevent us from the apprehension about where all of this might lead to. Strengthening the independence of the judiciary, a judiciary that is occasionally capable of taking courageous and important decisions, such as the decision of the Supreme Court in December 2018, declaring the unconstitutionality of the dissolution of parliament uh, at the time. But institutionally speaking, the independence of the judiciary needs uh, to be strengthened. It uh, would have required increasing the investigatory capacity and, uh, in my opinion, importantly, reforms of the office of the attorney general, which combines advocacy of the state and the functions of a public prosecutor. And that creates a very clear conflict of interest for the office when those that are to be investigated and prosecutors are precisely state agencies. And it would have required finishing the overall reliance on ad hoc commissions which have clearly not produced at the level of uh, confidence in institutions that was expected at one point from them, it would have required establishing a real and serious uh, truth commission. On the part of civil society, again, it would also have required greater intercommunal cooperation in order to, among other things, press for the reforms that I just mentioned and uh, for other reforms that were crucial for uh, Sri Lanka's uh, future, including strengthening the civilian oversight over the security services. But now this is where we are. And uh, I think that with Charles, uh, while I think that there are very important uh, initiatives proposed in the High Commissioner's uh, uh, latest report, in, and that uh, though all of them should be considered, including universal jurisdiction cases, probably the creation of a country-specific uh, uh, mandate. But however, I think with Charles that ultimately the fate of Sri Lanka is going to depend on Sri Lankan's initiatives. And in ceasing to understand the human rights project as a zero-sum game, as if it were simply of interest to one community, seizing rather the opportunity to use the integrative potential of, uh, hu of the human rights language in order to, among other things, further a development project which should not be considered simply in terms of economic development, but for the first time of the security of the rights of all Sri Lankans. And I will stop here, but I will be very happy to discuss uh, later on and uh, moreover to listen uh, to my fellow panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Pablo. And now we're going to hear from a few of our Sri Lankan panelists. Um, and first up is Bhavani Fonseca, 
who is a senior researcher at the Centre for Policy Alternatives, an attorney at law in Sri Lanka, an author and activist. Bhavani. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you to the organisers for organising this very timely discussion. Um, I have five minutes to talk about democratic space and the rule of law, and so I'm going to keep my comments very brief, but hopefully we have time during the, the next session to go a bit deeper into it. Um, we are having this conversation during uh, the lead up to the Human Rights Council, and it's very important at this time to also reflect uh, while we look at the High Commissioner's report and the comments made by the previous two speakers as to what the real context is on the ground. Um, and also to factor in, and this is very important, that we are globally in a context, in a pandemic, unprecedented challenges. And it is in this context that we will also see measures being taken to address the growing and multi-pronged challenges at play. So in Sri Lanka, we have seen in the last 15 months, really from the election of the president in November 2019, and really in 2020, a pandemic, uh, very worrying signs in terms of democratic backsliding and the erosion of the rule of law. Now, uh, as I said, the pandemic will bring in various measures. And what we have seen in Sri Lanka are the measures that are concerning in terms of legality, proportionality, and non-discrimination. And I'll try to address some of these issues as well as uh, raising the, them later on. But in 2020 alone, what we have seen is a very a strong executive presidency, presidency coming about. Uh, we've seen militarized governance, and in this I say former and serving military officials playing a dominant role um, in the pandemic, but also in governance of key civilian positions being taken by these individuals. We have seen during 2020 uh, the lockdown, but also very concerning, for five months we did not have a parliament, a functioning parliament. So what that meant was there was no oversight, there was no effective check and balance, and contrasting this was a very powerful executive rule that was emerging in Sri Lanka. In contrast, also we had at the same time various measures being brought in to curtail civilian um, a civic liberties, fundamental freedom. So we had uh, restrictions of movement, on expression, on uh, we saw a spate of high profile arrest detentions happening and these are very serious concern. But this also goes to the whole question that we had um, measures being introduced that were extra legal, extremely broad and vague. So there was a real concern as to what was going on and the legality of these questions. And at the same time, this is all in 2020, we also saw a spate of task forces being appointed, uh, task forces that had a range of functions, mainly to address what was happening with uh, the pandemic. But in June, we also saw other task forces appointed, and this has a long-term implication so we have government with a very strong executive, but also governance in terms of task forces and a militarized approach. In 2020, we also saw a very key constitutional amendment being passed, the 20th Amendment, go into the details. But in a nutshell, it really strengthened and consolidated the executive rule and removed the checks and balances. So what started in terms of the COVID response was seen with the constitutional amendment was really the erosion of the rule of law, concerns with the separation of power. So, I mean, those are very, very worrying trends we are facing in Sri Lanka. Added to this is the whole issue of targeting um, individuals 
queen as the space with descent is fast shrinking. Um, so we've seen a steady attack on processes, systems that were investigating, prosecuting, violations, corruption, and now we've seen a heightened sense of political victimization. So they, this, um, the trend is that the, the democratic space is fast shrinking in terms of governance and government, but also in terms of targeting those who've been involved in terms of accountability, in terms of good government. And finally, um, I've been told I only have one minute, is this entrenched culture of impunity, and I, I hope my colleagues speak to this, is this, there is really, there's no hope for justice in Sri Lanka. And countering this is the high surveillance. So this is a very extremely dangerous situation. And I want to end with this comment the High Commissioner makes in her report. Sri Lanka is at a critical turning point. And there's no way of further amplifying this, but to say that this is the moment to take note and to act on this. So I will end here and hopefully we have time to take more, go into more detail in terms of some of the issues raised. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bhavani, for that. Um, and next we have Amir Faiz, um, who is a lawyer, director of international affairs at the Sri Lanka Muslim Congress, writer and a human rights activist. And Amir will speak to us about the challenges faced by the Muslim community in Sri Lanka. Faiz. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> greetings from Colombo to everyone. Um, as Melissa said, I'm expected to talk about the challenges faced by the Muslim communities. And <clears throat> as Bhavani said, it will be limited within five minutes. And uh, let me try to be brief as possible. The systemic discrimination and structural violence against Muslim, against numerically smaller communities have been there. But since the end of the war in 2019, targeting religious minorities such as evangelical Christians and Muslims grew. And from about 2012, the violence against Muslims intensified. In 2014, 15, 18, Muslim places of worship, businesses, houses were attacked in several places. Using the Easter Sunday terrorist attack of April 2019, in May 2019, the violence was repeated. And these were not mere small scale violence, they were mass scale violence targeting the Muslims economy, livelihoods and overall existence with dignity. In the backdrop of using growing Islamophobia, the Easter Sunday attacks in 2019 was used Sorry, I, I think I got pressed some button and got muted a bit. When the pandemic struck, the Muslim community was accused of being the introducers, carriers, and spreaders of virus and beyond. The spewing of hate and fake stories of Muslims being unpatrio unpatriotic and undisciplined through both the mainstream and social media was un precedented and unimaginable leading up to both the presidential elections in 2019 and the parliamentary elections in 2020. It is in furtherance of this hate and vengeance against Muslims, the right to bury their dead need to be looked at. The pandemic also laid bare institutionalized anti-Muslim traits. There has been prolonged lockdowns and isolation areas and scarce, sub, scarce access or supply of essential items, including medicine, when it came to Muslim areas. Due to the forcible cremation policy, 
the Muslims have been reluctant to seek medical assistance even for regular ailments, thus making them more vulnerable to COVID-19. The government's intransigence was manifested when it debunked its own experts committee's unanimous report that recommended safe burial. This committee consisted of re renowned specialists in the relevant fields. The systematic the systematic uh, systemic violence of rights and violence against Muslims have also been acknowledged by international in independent institutions. The usually cautious organization of Islamic cooperation, its Council of Foreign Ministers and its Permanent Human Rights Commission have all issued statements expressing concerns and have called upon the government repeatedly to respect the sentiments of religious minorities. The UN UNHRC's special procedure mandate holders have repeatedly written, and as late as 5th of February, a report written collectively by nine special rapporteurs has, amongst others, reiterated that there has been no established medical or scientific evidence in Sri Lanka or other countries that the burial of dead bodies leads to increased risk of spreading communicable diseases such as COVID-19. They, they went on to urge the government to stop the forced cremation and to provide remedy and ensure accountability for cremation that were carried out by error. To cap it all, the highest global authority on human rights, the Human Rights Commissioner, Madam Michelle Bachelet, has, amongst others, has this to say in her report to the forthcoming session. The COVID-19 pandemic has also impacted on religious freedom and exacerbated the prevailing marginalization and discrimination suffered by the Muslim community. The High Commissioner is concerned that the government's decision to mandate cremation for all those affected by COVID-19 has prevented Muslims from practicing their own burial rights and has disproportionately affected religious minorities and exacerbated distress and tension. She, the High Commissioner has gone on to state the government has now demonstrated in its in in in, in the government has gone on to demonstrate its inability and unwillingness to pursue a meaningful path towards accountability for international crimes and serious human rights violations. This must be understood to include the serious violations of the rights of the members of the country's Muslim community as well. I must also mention here that despite significant observations and comments, the High Commissioner has also missed out on recommendations relating to the said violations and constitutional derogations of religious practices of religious minorities, and that needs to be fixed. Another significant challenge faced by the Muslim community is the continued patronage politics preferred by Muslim political and also the so-called religious leaderships at the expense of steadfastly standing by principles and or adhering or protecting and promoting the rule of law. A clear case in point is the supporting of the enactment of the 20th Amendment of the Constitution to the Constitution by majority of the Muslim MPs from Muslim parties who were elected on an anti-current regime campaign. The, and that was in an act of absolute selfishness and tomfoolery, to put it mildly. At the same time, repeatedly, over a period of time, a few Muslims have always been occupying perceived seats of power in the cabinet of ministers or as executive officials whom the community believed they could deliver. But that has not been the case. Therefore, it's also a challenge to convince the Muslim community to start believing in and supporting to strengthen democratic institutions and mechanisms. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Faiz. And next, we're going to hear from Ambika Satkanathan, um, who is a lawyer, researcher, writer, author, human rights advocate, and former commissioner of the Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka. Ambika. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you for the thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, yesterday was the 25th anniversary of the Kumarapuram massacre, in which 26 civilians, including 13 children and a pregnant woman, were killed by army personnel. 
Yesterday, families of the victims and civil society organizations gathered to remember the victims. First, they were prevented from doing so by the police. Thereafter, they were allowed to conduct the ceremony, but according to civil society activists who were there, there was heavy police and military presence in the area. And police officers kept instructing them to conclude the ceremony quickly. The question then uh, that we have to ask is, would a government that is committed to accountability and reconciliation do this? Surveillance, harassment, and intimidation of civil society, particularly in the North and the East, is increasing. A civil society colleague in the Eastern province received phone calls from security officials instructing him to cancel a campaign to release those detained under the PTA. Police personnel threatened to arrest persons who turned up for a demonstration as part of the same campaign in the Northern province. Another colleague in the Eastern province received visits to their institution by police intelligence personnel requesting information about their staff, funding, and work plan. Before questions are raised whether these incidents were reported, yes, many of these incidents were reported to the local office of the Human Rights Commission. I'd like to point out that surveillance and intimidation of civil society is part of a continuum because it didn't entirely disappear during Yahapalnya regime. The difference is that at that time, it was not widespread or common. And at that time, civil society felt they could report it to the Human Rights Commission without facing reprisals. Although the commission's interventions resulted in the immediate secession of such uh, extra legal action, the oppressive and extra legal structures and processes remained intact. More concerning is, most concerning right now is also the labeling of victims, dissenters, human rights defenders, and particularly those who call for accountability or international intervention as traitors, anti-national, and even terrorists. It would not be surprising if the Sri Lankan panelists on this very webinar are called such names in tomorrow's newspapers. This is intimidation and bullying of citizens aimed at preventing them from enjoying their democratic rights. That is the right to dissent, the right to criticize the government and hold it to account. Please ask yourselves if such a government will initiate a credible process to deal with the past. The second issue I'd like to highlight is increased and rapid militarization not only in the North and East, but also in the entire country, as illustrated by the president using Section 12 of the Public Security Ordinance to call out the armed forces to maintain law and order, appointing military officers to positions in civil administration, the military leading the COVID response, and so on. In this militarized context, there are attempts to also take over land in the North and the East by the archeological department and the forestry department. For instance, recently a minister, Vidura Vikramanayaka, in violation of a court order, installed a Buddha statue in Mulaitivu at the site of a Hindu temple. Photographs of the event show that the site was swarming with military personnel. But while we critique militarization, we must remember that militarization of civilian space began aggressively during the first Rajapaksa regime. Contrary to criticisms leveled by the Rajapaksa regime against the Yahapalnya regime, Yahapalnya regrettably did not initiate demilitarization. At most, after 2015, there was a temporary partial freezing of militarization, which resumed with vigor during the second Rajapaksa regime. The third issue I would like to highlight is the continued use of the Prevention of Terrorism Act, which allows for arbitrary arrest and detention for 18 months without being produced before a magistrate. The most recent arrest using the PTA is that of poet Alnaf Jazim from Mana due to a book of poetry, which supposedly promotes extremism, but according to writers and poets actually calls for an end to extremism. The PTA also creates room for torture, as illustrated by a Human Rights Commission study of prisons, which found that in the study sample, 84% of male PTA inmates said that they had suffered torture following arrest. An overwhelming majority of those who were subjected to torture, 90%, said they were made to sign confessions after torture. It is also important to note that there have been instances when the Sri Lankan courts have also found that confessions were obtained through torture. 
Finally, our quest for truth and justice have failed because we have focused only on the nature of governments and not on the nature of the state. That is a majoritarian state driven by Sinhala Buddhist nationalism in which the discrimination of numerical minorities is normalized. Moreover, in a patronage driven society with a feudal hangover, where ethno-nationalism motivates public policy making, the state and its structures are hostile to accountability, particularly for wartime violations. As I have shown, extra legal and oppressive structures and processes remain intact. In this context, do you think the mother of a disappeared person or the family member of a journalist who was extrajudicially killed is likely to see justice in their lifetime? We fear that they will not because over 70 mothers and fathers have passed away just in the last few years without finding out the truth about the plight of their loved ones. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Um, and next we will hear from Stephen J. Rapp, um, who is a senior fellow at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum Center for the Prevention of Genocide and at Oxford University Center for Ethics, Law and Armed Conflict. He also serves as chair of the Commission for International Justice and Accountability. From 2009 to 2015, he was US ambassador at large for global criminal justice. In October 2009, his office issued a report concluding that there was credible evidence of serious human rights violations committed in Sri Lanka during the final phase of the conflict in 2008 to 2009. Rapp made official visits to the country in 2012 and 2014 and engaged actively at the UN Human Rights Council during 2012 to 2015 in support of a series of resolutions to, to further genuine accountability in Sri Lanka. Um, Stephen will speak to us about the international options available. Thank you very much, Melissa. It's, it's a great honor to be with, with all of you. Uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, uh, uh, good evening. As Melissa said, I'm going to talk about the responses of, of the international community, the options that are available. Uh, but first, I'd like to deal with the question of, of why the international community is engaged and, and why the international community should be engaged. And, and I'm reminded of, of my own visit uh, uh, to the island in February of 2012 uh, in that regard, uh, uh, because I see, first of all, uh, the fact that as, as fellow human beings, uh, uh, we have an obligation uh, everywhere in the world to, uh, uh, to uh, protect the rights, the universal human rights of, of, our, of our fellow humans. And, and I'm reminded, and, and that includes, of course, the rights to, to truth and justice after serious violations of, of, of human rights. I, I'm reminded of um, the day I was in Molotivu and, uh, and, and a group of, of women whose, whose children had, had gone missing, uh, who, who themselves were, were broken and bent uh, from shrapnel of, in, from, that they'd received during the no-fire zone, were in a church and, and, and pulled themselves uh, across the room to to show me pictures of, of, of their children that, that were missing. Uh, they weren't partisans of the LTTE. Indeed, in most cases, the children had been abducted and made into child soldiers, but had been seen later uh, in, in, in mid-May, even, even after, the, after the defeat of the LTTE, and then had, had disappeared. And, and I promised to follow up and, and continue to, to do that. And, and a few days later, I heard a report back that those women had been harassed by the security service and and threatened uh, with with jail them, themselves, and uh, and uh, the interpreter that I had uh, during that visit uh, reported to me that the women's response was, uh, you know, if if if, you, if we, we can't have the truth of, about our loved ones, you might as well just kill us. You might as well just kill us because life's not worth living. And and that's something I think that all of us in, in the world need to empathize with, and, and act on, and that what continues to motivate me. Uh, the other problem is that there can be further victims in the future, further crimes. I can recall when I was there, um, I would engage as we did. And our strategy in the US government for, for about three years was to really press hard for national authorities uh, to live up uh, to, their, to their obligations. And, and I'd hear people say, uh, we, need to, we need to turn the page. Uh, uh, we need to focus uh, on on development. Uh, these issues are too difficult. Uh, uh, we'll, uh, you know, uh, uh, we'll alienate the nation's heroes. Uh, and what 
I noted to them was that violations were continuing. They weren't necessarily the same kind of violations, but that uh, you know people were being abducted. Uh, there were crimes and corruption that the, the same people, some of the same people involved in the violations were committing these acts, that, that impunity was contagious and that the message sent that you could get away with, with killing uh, innocent people, you could get away with killing uh, uh, people that had surrendered and, and that were helpless. Uh, facts that were found even by uh, commissions in, in Sri Lanka, uh, that you could uh, uh, get away with that, uh, led people to think they could get away with other things as well. Uh, we saw it during the, uh, during the last few years when there was actually some effort to deal with the so-called uh, emblematic cases. Uh, these weren't those that related directly to the end of the conflict. Those seemed to be radioactive. But uh, I can recall in particular the Trinco 11 case of 11 schoolboys abducted uh, during the same time period, but, but nothing political, nothing terrorist about, uh, about it at all. They were of different ethnicities and, and religions, and they were kidnapped and held at the, at the naval base at Trinco by a number of officers uh, in order to extort, in the end, to, uh, uh, to murder them uh, and, and to obtain uh, money from, from their parents. And there were diligent efforts to prosecute those cases despite obstruction, multiple individuals that were, uh, uh, that were charged. And now uh, with this new government, uh, we see that effort, that, that fledgling effort at justice and dealing with unrelated to some extent crimes, but some of the same folks uh, is being obstructed. There's a commission, uh, this commission on political victimization, which is in fact a commission for the obstruction of justice. And and, and what a, what an outrage it is at the head of that commission that's that's trying to prevent the prosecution of people involved in the abduction and murder of innocent boys uh, is now head of the missing persons office. Uh, and we just see this sort of uh, defiance of 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 the rule of law, of the idea of accountability. And, and, and something that creates then an epidemic, frankly, of, uh, of, uh, of impunity, which threatens others in the future who could suffer the same kind of crimes from, from, from whatever community. And that's why we need to respond. Now, of course, we'll hear from the government, oh, we'll do something ourselves. But we've had before the Lessons Learned Commission, the Re Reconciliation Commission, notice the word truth was missing there. They did, however, find there were six incidents uh, in which there was strong suspicion of civilians being killed uh, and, and, and no action was taken. A military uh, inquiry uh, closed uh, uh, that, uh, that investigation without any response. Uh, the, the Paranagama Commission talked about the killing of surrenderees, the white flag killings, the killing of the 12-year-old boy, uh, found that there was credible evidence, no follow-up at all. And now we're even hearing the government as it tries to deflect the efforts to a resolution in the next council is talking about a commission to, to look at what happened on accountability in the past, which of course is another effort to close the door and to, to obstruct justice. Finally, from an international point of view, what we're doing here is I think dealing with the credibility of our whole system. We have other places in the world where horrible things continue to occur in, in Syria, in Myanmar, in uh, uh, South Sudan and, and elsewhere. And the UN Human Rights Council has, has become the go-to place uh, in those situations uh, to get uh, uh, commissions established to find the facts and to begin to lay the grounds for, for accountability. If, um, if the message out of the Sri Lanka process is, well, you can wait it out, uh, after 10 years they can say, well, enough already, uh, close it and let them get on with their business. What does that say for the victims in these other situations? What is the prospect in the future uh, uh, for the credibility uh, in, in terms of the enforcement and compliance with human rights? It won't be just an epidemic of impunity, it'll be a, a pandemic of impunity. And that's what the world risks if, if we don't uh, grasp uh, the obligation that all of us, I think, have and, and make sure that we continue this fight for, for truth and justice uh, for the people of, of, of Sri Lanka. So, so what can be done? Uh, first of all, there's the, the UN side of it, and that's not the the only part of it, and, and very, very pleased with the, the strong report of, of, the, of the High Commissioner uh, on these issues. Obviously, the need to continue monitoring, whether that's done by her office or by a special rapporteur, extremely important that this stay on the radar screen. Uh, but I'm particularly excited by the second re uh, recommendation, uh, 61B, that calls for a, a dedicated capacity to uh, uh, to uh, collect and preserve evidence and other related information for future accountability process and, and to support uh, universal jurisdiction until and if there's a, a, um, a, a genuine process at, at the national level. 
Uh, we've seen that, that this has been done earlier in the case of, of, of North Korea, uh, but most particularly, uh, but in a larger way, uh, in the case of, of Syria uh, and, uh, and, and Myanmar. And of course, uh, the UN has done some great reports uh, in which uh, all of us have been involved in, in supporting those efforts and assisting those efforts. Uh, but it's very important to develop evidence uh, that can be used in court uh, that connects the dots uh, between the horrors the, that happen, the, the, the people that are, that are killed, the, the innocents, the, the helpless uh, that, are, that are targeted, and, uh, uh, and, and those that really made it happen. Uh, not always the low-level people who are, uh, who are who are pushed along or draftees in this effort, but the, but those that uh, uh, that caused it to occur, and and drawing those connections, which we've had to do in my own experience as an international prosecutor in 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 the Rwanda Tribunal or at Sierra Leone or I prosecuted a, a chief of state, uh, th that's extremely important, and and that is a place where this can be done. And of course, there's a lot of work that's been done, and and it, done by civil society, but it needs to be vetted and verified. And this can be a resource to national prosecutors uh, when they do have an individual who's in country or someone that they can get their hands on uh, that they can prosecute. And we've seen that uh, even in Syria where the conflict continues, uh, there's been an ex excellent case prosecuted in, in, in Germany against two uh, officers alleged to be involved in, in, in torture, uh, sending a clear signal to those victims back in Molotivu and elsewhere. Uh, that uh, that justice is possible. It's not uh, it's not enough, uh, but it's but it's a start. It's a it's a bit of an inoculation uh, against uh, uh, this epidemic of of of, of impunity. Um, additionally, the UN, of course, needs to uh, deal with the vetting of, uh, of peacekeepers, and uh, there's been positive messaging on that. And in the past, there was the work of the of the uh, uh, of the Commission for Human Rights in, uh, in in Sri Lanka working on vetting. And of course, that's no longer independent. It has a minister in charge of it. Uh, but now the UN really does need to step up, working with my own country that has a vet Leahy vetting program and, and make sure that uh, that people don't go back into peacekeeping and that uh, we don't rely on on Sri Lankan peacekeepers, as important as, as peacekeeping is in the world uh, uh, in, until it, it cleans up its act and actually follows up on the credible allegations that have been made in the past in terms of the Haiti force and, and, and others. And I saw how those were just completely uh, swept under the rug. The UN can't be credible in the world uh, if, it, if it sends out peacekeepers with human rights violations full stop. And the UN itself uh, needs, as Charles reported, uh, certainly in terms of the events of 2009, but this is the continued problem. Uh, it, it can get involved in in, in trying to work in certain areas and then de-emphasizing human rights, putting it on the back burner, wanting to work on technical assistance in some area or another. Uh, it can't be conflicted that way. No normalization. Not with a government that's engaged in, in, in mass impunity. Not in a government that's defying the rights, the most fundamental rights uh, to truth and justice for people whose who's very right to life, the most fundamental right uh, and, and to human dignity. Uh, in, the, in the Human Rights Declaration uh, are, not, are not being upheld. Then what other things can be done? And it's not at the UN, where obviously the UN Security Council would presumably would be blocked, uh, uh, where effective action may be limited in terms of the ability to put on sanctions, for instance, as the Security Council has done in other situations. Their uh, individual states can step up, particularly with this global Magnitsky uh, sanctions regimes that have been established in the United States, in, in the United Kingdom, and now in now in Europe. Uh, as you know, the United States, even under President Trump, put Shivendra Silva on the global Magnitsky list. Others uh, should follow based upon the evidence, including the evidence that's going to be developed by this uh, dedicated capacity. Uh, and, and that can also open the way for, for prosecutions of those that may enable those individuals or, or, or engage their financial transactions. Those individuals uh, and, and companies can be prosecuted as we've had some that have involved billions of dollars in fines for, for banks that have uh, engaged in transactions with, with sanctioned uh, individuals. Send that, that kind of uh, clear, uh, clear message. Uh, there are also things in terms of, of aid and trade. And of course, uh, we don't want people to suffer. Um, we don't, sanctions when they attack a whole, a whole nation, I think are inappropriate. And we need to find ways that, that target uh, this, uh, the, these kind of measures. But of course, at the same time, 
uh, we have to make demands uh, if international resources are going to go to Sri Lanka, uh, that there be inclusive governance, that it not be a, a majoritarian, uh, so, um, you know, Sinhala state that, that ignores the interests of, of, of Muslims, Hindus, ignores the interests of the Muslim and, and, and Tamil communities and, 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 uh, and, and only serves a, a certain interest. It has to serve all interests. And, and certainly when, uh, uh, even when something so important as the International Monetary Fund's uh, uh, aid, uh, which the government may seek in the near future, in part because of the, of the obligations taken, off, taken on with China by the previous government, uh, uh, high interest loans for, for, for you know, unwise development projects, now they need uh, uh, aid from the international community. It ought to be a clear condition uh, that, uh, that uh, Sri Lanka is in fact not going forward with this sort of, uh, sort of process of, uh, of, of impunity uh, and of uh, only aiding certain communities, but that it be an inclusive process and that there be justice in that, in that process uh, and, and there be support to it. Uh, these things have to mean something if those, if those uh, victims are going to have the, their rights to, to truth and justice, and particularly if we're going to deter violations uh, uh, in Sri Lanka in the future and, and globally. And, and that's why the international community, I hope, and, and I'll certainly be engaged as much as I can, will be seeking to pass a resolution uh, uh, that, uh, that follows up uh, on the earlier resolutions, follows up on the obligations that the government itself signed on to in the unanimous resolution in 2015 uh, for transitional justice, which, uh, uh, which obviously includes that truth commission, which is extremely important uh, and didn't happen, <laughs> and includes the, uh, uh, the, the investigation and prosecution of, of those responsible for serious violations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, and next we're, we will hear from Shreen Sarur, who is a Sri Lankan peace and women's rights activist, founder of the Manar Women's Development Foundation to help promote women's empowerment. She is the winner of many international and local awards for her activism, promoting women's empowerment, rule of law and human rights, and a writer. Uh, Shreen, over to you. Thank you. Um, Warm greetings to everybody, and I will just uh, follow up uh, with my uh, three other Sri Lankan panelists uh, some of the things uh, that are kind of something that's striking that I want to put it to the table. Uh, one is um, with regard to the Muslim community that we have to view what is happening to the Muslim community as a part of systematic violation uh, that that enjoyed culture of impunity. So it is part of that racism. It's a structure of the racism. Uh, with regard to the lockdown areas uh, uh, Faiz talked about, it's also very interesting, this whole cremation, forcible cremation, or this policy of uh, forcible cremation, is it's not just something that happened because of the pandemic alone. This is part of hate mongering, uh, the anti-Muslim attacks that has been ongoing. So it's just something, an opportunity happened to this government to punish the Muslim community as a whole and also to um, the government to show that they are trying to make a pure Buddhist country and that one country and one law. The whole cremation policy is part of that racist venom, that structure. So that's something that we need to acknowledge. With regard to Ambika's uh, points, I want to add a few things with regard to the PTA. Uh, apart from PTA, Sri Lanka has you know, taken the ICCPR Act and then used it against the ethnic minority, and which is very, very important for us to note. Uh, and also, like um, more recently, PTA has also used against uh, lots of uh, Muslims. Uh, the previous government, the good governance government, supposedly, uh, also used the PTA to arrest over 2,000 Muslims in the post-Easter context. And right now, um, I don't know for concretely the numbers, but over 300 odd Muslims are uh, arrested under PTA. They are being accused of having connection to National Taufik Jamaat, which was uh, behind the Easter bombing. And more recently, uh, last three months, we have been grappling with three women, uh, wives and mothers of uh, who have been arrested. 
with infant, one starting from eight months to 12 months to uh, one and a half year infants being taken with the mothers and kept in TID custody to date. The families don't have access to these uh, infants and mothers and we don't know what is happening to them because there aren't anybody left in this their family also to look for them sometimes the entire family is under detention so this is something that we need to also to highlight and also like the surveillance there are new forms of su surveillance uh, I mean, it's not only intelligence, uniform men, CID, NIB, all these people, but it is also the Sri Lankan government officers. Of, right now, it is government state officers who are surveillancing us. The, this involved the government the GA, the government agent, the, the DS officers, the banks, uh, you name it. Anybody uh, that we have become the enemies. And also, like you all uh, aware of the fact that the Sri Lankan National en Energy Secretariat was brought under the Defense Ministry, that is under Kamal Gunabadana, and we are supposed to report to, um, um, you know, the Secretary Kamal Gunabadana. So the problem is many of the NGOs, which are very small uh, NGOs, that I am part of it, also being asked to register or rather forced to register under the Energy Act. And also like Sri Lanka is now in the process of passing a very vicious um, VSSO Act, Voluntary Service Organization Act. So to date, many of the local organizations have been told that we have done illegitimate activities. The illegitimate activities means engaging with any form of transitional justice mechanism, including engaging with OMP, the very mechanism that government set it up. Uh, we have been asked by the military guys, asked by the government officers, the information that we gave it to OMP. Well, this is OMP is the government structure. If the military wants, military can go and ask them why they, why every organization that engage with the OMP is systematically targeted is something that that well, that high commissioner's office need to look at it because the town transitional justice process did not just all of a sudden came it came through 30 slash one a resolution right it's everybody's responsibility to look at that and we were also asked to force to work only on natural disaster and physical construction that we can't do anything else beyond that uh, i will talk about one example where one of my colleague uh you know like uh, because of the intimidation his entire board members have to go away so he has to start a new uh, you know like body and the board members new board members thus he has to do a resolution and he went to the bank the bank manager said i can't allow you to access your bank account till you register uh, with the nnjo secretary this is a private bank right same thing happened with regard to another organization where the government agent has written saying that it is illegitimate to accept foreign funding therefore you have to locally fundraise and the fundraising is also to uh, work on uh, natural disasters right so there is this level of intimidation and yes everybody says there is no white man but this is this is how sri lankan government is making a point that the NGOs don't function in this uh, this country and slowly that we die down, right? So that's very systematically done. Um, with regard to um, some of the minority rights and the collective positive things that even, I mean, lots of my colleagues have spoken about it, but I want to talk about in the last few months, what is happening in the country is something that is uh, refreshing to many of us even though there is a lot of control on freedom of expression, assembly and all with, with pandemic and also with militarization, with the dictatorship right now, but people are coming out, whether it's right to, you know, demanding right to memorialization, truth and access to justice, burial issues, workers' right, um, resistant against land grab, livelihood grabs by the military and the single majoritarian government, how they are trying to nullify the 13th Amendment to the Constitution by, uh, you know, like giving power to the governors that comes directly from the president that the governors are ordering, uh, you know, the land to be divided and taken, Tamil people's land being taken and given to Sinhalese and all those things. It's direct violation of 13th Amendment and local authority members are not allowed to function the way that 
they are supposed to function the dss office that has the land uh, right to uh, distribute land has been stopped or if they do it they are being penalized so all these things are happening but more recently this uh, the the p2p uh, uh, the march potuvil uh, to poligandi um, Subha will agree with me that the Muslims came in large numbers to support this and make it very successful. And thanks to Tamil community uh, as well to like include some of the Muslim issues also. Like and also thanks to some of the Tamil politicians who stood up for the Muslim community's rights. And it may it has already made the Muslim Tamil community coming together as victims coming together. And these people P two P movement has to become peoples to people movement. uh you know with the with the political parties coming together but the but the challenge here is what faiz talked about it that the sri lankan muslim political leadership and sri lankan muslim religious leadership has been bartering muslim communities rights for perks and privileges in that context it's going to be very difficult for victim community to connect and demand for justice that is what we need right now in this country and and uh, what bawali talked about and ambika talked about the roll back access to justice and all to date there is not a single precedent setting case uh, uh, decision with regard to attacks on minority religious right so much so day before yesterday uh, the archbishop malcolm ranjit a uh, call for international investigation on the easter attack because the three commissions that were set up by the sri lankan government the previous hapalaniya uh, two um commissions and then the rajapaksha all these commissions failed to give justice to the the minority religious community that was part of uh, suffered part of this attack and also the muslim community really want to know what happened uh you know how did the easter bombing happen and what how did government fail to prevent this attack so it's very important to uh, kind of like finding justice uh, uh you know like outside the country as well people are articulating that the minority religious community is articulating that and very interestingly uh, you know the forthcoming uh, geneva session it's going to be the stage to show how uh, muslim and tamil uh, or rather tamil speaking community is going to come together how the politicians are going to uh, you know uh, kind of weaken that process as you all know the currently the, the the justice minister is a muslim and also sri lankan government hearing high commissioner's report set up a uh, three member human rights committee to investigate uh, into human rights violation all of a sudden they have woken up the head of it is also muslim so you will have two muslims coming and countering and telling nothing is happening to the muslim community we will take care of uh, sri lanka uh, rights violation and all those things so that's very problematic because um du during previous rajapaksha regime uh, it was uh, it, then also it was uh, a muslim justice minister who uh, with the religious uh, leaders and politician went to geneva to defend rajapaksha regime previously and that is still a scar with the tamil minority community still try, you know reaching out to that community has been uh, very difficult even though there are some positive things that i talked about it the other thing i want to raise it is about uh, this whole dividing and ruling ruling the minority community is now coming with pakistan coming in uh imran khan is coming to sri lanka on the 23rd on the 24th he is addressing the sri lankan parliament exactly the day the high commissioner is going to present her oral report what does it mean to us imran khan also is coming from china's back backing and and china is going to back sri lanka to sri lanka to walk out of the resolution and imran khan is going to lobby uh, the oic country so what it means to the muslim countries uh, to 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 back the resolution is something very questionable whereas muslim community in sri lanka really want justice and and many of the uh, the victims of uh, the forced cremation have they have gone to different levels of uh, uh uh you know the judicial process in sri lanka whether it's a magistrate court or district court uh, you know the the writ applications have been filed in appeal court supreme court has just thrown um a request so they are also now filing case with un human rights committee under the optional protocol iccpr uh, optional protocol so that that also indicates that the victims need 
access to justice outside the Sri outside Sri Lanka because they are not finding anything positive in country. And then with regard to uh, High Commissioner's report, um, it is a fresh air to see uh, the triple I am uh, being mentioned because this is something that the victim communities asked in 2015 when OISL report uh, was finalized in March 2015. It took some time for it to come, but then still people were asking about triple I M uh, mechanism to be set up so that their evidence can be gathered in systematic way but it's a bit too late because right now much of the evidence that we have gathered have either been um, destroyed or we are we are compelled to destroy the evidence that we have collected so i don't know how communities can help to uh, uh, you know get the evidence back again but it's too late but i i hope uh, the, the the high commissioner's office can help this being set up so that at least we can preserve some of the, um, uh, you know, like evidence that is uh, still um, with the communities and with people outside the country. In addition to that, I also, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. I'm afraid we're running a bit over time. Um, okay. I'll, I'll just finish. Come back to this in the discussion. Yeah. Okay. In, add in addition to that, I also want to highlight uh, High Commissioner's uh, recent mandate, uh, that is uh, October 2020 Resolution 45-31, which talks about conflict prevention. Uh, to continue to strengthen the capability of uh, her office to identify, verify, manage, and analyze the data uh, and, and early warning early warning shine emerging from all sources for her to also use that to Sri Lanka and also the 10 special reporters who have visited Sri Lanka and Pablo's four visits and uh, the, the recommendation there are over 400 recommendations if Sri Lanka walks out of all these things it's shame on all these special reporters hard work and also the victim communities work with the special repertoires as also this also will set a trend that the special repertoire procedures have been taken for granted by the Sri Lankan government. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Shreen, um, and apologies for, for interrupting. Um, we now have our, our final speaker, um, Maitya Paranan Sumanthiran is a member of parliament, spokesperson for the Tamil National Alliance and President's Council. Um, over to you, Sumanthiran. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings, everyone. Thank you for uh, inviting me to participate uh, uh, in this discussion. Uh, I've been uh, asked to speak uh, and say uh, the obvious, uh, why domestic mechanisms will not uh, work in Sri Lanka. Uh, that's quite obvious. Uh, but it may be important uh, to just trace back uh, a few events from the past. In 2006, uh, there was a commission of inquiry set up under international pressure uh, by the previous Rajapaksa government to inquire into serious human rights uh, violations. There were 15 or 16 cases identified. And uh, then there was another panel set up to monitor its work. Uh, that was called IJEP, International Independent Group of Eminent Persons, headed by uh, Justice Bhagwati. After a while, uh, Justice Bhagwati's commission uh, or the, the eminent group of persons withdrew their mandate and stated that they cannot continue this work because Sri Lanka lacks the political will uh, to uh, investigate serious uh, violations of human rights in the country. Now, this has again been reflected in the High Commissioner's report, uh, I can see at paragraph 56, she says Sri Lanka's, uh, she may calls it inability uh, and unwillingness uh, to pursue a path towards uh, accountability. So uh, we've had uh, many uh, instances, uh, too uh, numerous to recount, uh, but there have been some cases where they have done uh, a, show a showcase trial. Uh, and convicted uh, uh, one or two individuals uh, in the past. Uh, but even in those instances, uh, we saw how on appeal uh, they were acquitted. Uh, except one single case, uh, all of those prosecutions have ended up 
with the acquittal or even when the uh, highest court confirmed the uh, conviction and sentence, uh, there had been executive pardon given. The most recent being uh, that of uh, 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 Army Sergeant uh, Sunil Ratnayaka, uh, who was found guilty by a three judge panel. Uh, and then later, his conviction and sentence uh, were confirmed uh, by a five judge uh, panel of the Supreme Court, uh, murdering uh, five persons, including a toddler and another child, by slitting their throats. Uh, now he is a free person. He's been pardoned uh, by the present uh, president. Uh, in between, between 2015 and 2019, while the Sri Lankan government co-sponsored resolutions at the UN Human Rights Council, uh, we had a window opportunity or so we thought uh, of the government agreeing and um, working towards a uh, proper accountability mechanism, uh, a hybrid court. Uh, and so uh, the details of that were spelled out in uh, 30 slash uh, one with the participation of uh, international uh, judges, uh, prosecutors, uh, investigators, uh, uh, etc. Uh, but even when the Sri Lankan government co-sponsored resolutions three times, uh, the government back home told the people that they will not allow uh, foreigners uh, to uh, participate in these proceedings as judges. Uh, so the intention was clear, even when they uh, told the international community that they would do it and they uh, repeated it twice uh, for local consumption. It was very clear that they were not going to do it. Uh, and uh, now, of course, the new uh, second Rajapaksa regime has uh, officially written to the Human Rights Council uh, that they will not cooperate in any of these matters, uh, not just the accountability, but also in uh, matters uh, concerning reconciliation, which is very important because the guarantee of non-recurrence uh, can only happen uh, through a process in which uh, all uh, peoples in Sri Lanka uh, can feel and know that they equal uh, citizens. And so the uh, new constitution uh, has to be created with proper power sharing arrangements. Uh, we did that uh, for a while, uh, an exercise during the last government, but uh, that fell apart when the government uh, also fell. The uh, accountability issue, though, uh, will not move uh, in the UN Human Rights Council. We know that. We've tried that for 11 years. And even with co-sponsorship by the Sri Lankan government, uh, it did not even uh, start off. Uh, and so the only option that we have uh, is the International Criminal Court. Uh, there is no other option at present. Uh, Sri Lanka is not a signatory to Rome statute and uh, and therefore uh, cannot be compelled. Uh, Sri Lankan citizens cannot be compelled and brought before uh, that court, except through a Security Council uh, resolution. And that seems too far fetched, uh, given the friends uh, Sri Lanka has, uh, who are permanent members, who have uh, right of veto, etc. But nevertheless, for lack of any other mechanism, uh, we've uh, now started a process of asking the international actors uh, to uh, start on a path towards the ICC. Uh, of course, uh, universal jurisdiction, uh, sanctions, um, particularly travel bans uh, targeting uh, individuals uh, will be uh, very, very effective. Uh, and that uh, countries uh, that are committed uh, two human rights values uh, should pursue. We've so far had only uh, one person uh, tra travel ban, uh, but if we escalate that, uh, I think uh, the message uh, will be delivered uh, that impunity uh, cannot continue forever. It's been a long, hard road uh, for the victims, and they've been uh, they've lost uh, uh, any hope. Uh, uh, yet uh, they strive for justice uh, and as someone who uh, represents that community uh, and those people who still uh, come on the street and uh, as Stephen said when he met uh, some of them that's the kind of experience we have uh, day in and day out uh, 
we have to do justice uh, for those people. Uh, it is for the sake of those people, uh, as well as for the sake of future generations, uh, because if impunity is not nipped in the bud, uh, as uh, Stephen said, it becomes a pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Samantha. And um, we're now going to move on to the part of the event, which will be the panel discussion and the Q&A. We are running a little bit over time. So um, if possible, we will extend a little bit at the end of um, the event and, and run over for about 10 minutes or so um, to try and answer as, as many of your questions as we possibly can. Um, so the first question that I have um, is for, for any of the panelists. Um, is from Mario, uh, from advisor to Pearl. Uh, given that Sri Lanka's problems with regards to accountability and impunity are systemic and rooted in the nature of the state and not the government in power, what lessons can be taken from the international community's failure to hold Sri Lanka to its commitments so far? Who wants to take that? Anyone? Uh, how about you, Pablo? Can you start us off? Melissa, I am uh, very glad uh, to start you off, uh, but if you do not mind, uh, the signal was uh, breaking, so I missed uh, part of the question. Uh, please um, um, sure. restate it. Mm -hmm. and I will... uh, given that Sri Lanka's problems with regards to accountability and impunity are systemic, and rooted in the nature of the state and not the government in power, what lessons can be taken from the international community's failure to hold Sri Lanka to its commitments so far? Okay, uh, thank you very much. This is uh, actually a topic that uh, I think is uh, very important and uh, dear to my heart, which has a lot to do with the way in which we understand uh, prevention work. Uh, including the discussions about prevention within the UN system. I think that we pay a lot of lip service to the notion of a broad and, uh, and uh, to use the UN lingo upstream the prevention uh, strategy. But in reality, the work continues to focus a lot on crisis prevention and on the role of the international community. And as important as I think that that is, and as important as I think that, for example, early warning systems are, anything that is capable of triggering an early warning system means that we have failed to do a lot of preventive work beforehand. So I think that what we one of the lessons that I derive from this is that we have to stop praising rhetorically the idea of a broader prevention strategy and working out systematically what that means. Some of the elements are well known. In fact, this is not rocket science and the problem with prevention is not necessarily that we do not know how to do it. The problem is lack of commitment on the one hand and on the other, the disaggregation of knowledge and expertise at the UN system level. I think that a much more integrated approach that includes elements like, for example, legal and constitutional tools advising countries about how to remove, for example, discriminatory provisions from their constitutions, advising governments on strengthening the independence of the judiciary, increasing their capacities to carry out effective investigations. These are nuts and bolts elements of a preventive strategy that I think are not taken sufficiently seriously at the international level. So I think that we should once again uh, confirm the importance of the fact that prevention is a long-term process 
that we should not pay attention to it only when a country is uh, on the brink of a disaster, but long, long before. And in my thinking about prevention and about the idea of a systematic framework, Sri Lanka looms very large, to be perfectly honest, because this is a country with a long history of cycles of violence across all communities with institutions that could have easily prevented uh, those uh, cycles of violence. But I think that the international community has uh, focused on the wrong topics, uh, to be perfectly frank, that the bulk of preventive work takes place not through diplomatic good offices, as important as that is, the bulk of preventive work takes place at the local level with the initiatives that range from the micro level of policing strategies to the macro level of constitutional reforms to make the political pact truly inclusive and we know how to do all these things. So the role of the international community is to take seriously its own words about uh, prevention, to provide the assistance and to provide the leverage for countries to actually undertake uh, the serious reforms that would diminish the likelihood uh, of mass violations of the sort that Sri Lanka has already known in its past and that unfortunately in all estimations is posed to revisit in the future. Thank you for kicking us off on that one, Pablo. Um, Ambika, you wanted to come in? Yes, thank you, Melissa. Um, I think a few lessons to be learned. One, I think, is not just in Sri Lanka, but globally, uh, the international community tends to focus a lot on the formal structures, the law. And they think that by setting up institutions or by changing the law that you make a difference. Yes, you do, but only to a certain extent, because if you do not change the culture, nothing changes. I speak from experience of five years of being a commissioner of the Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka, where I learned this, where we could make a difference only until we were there. So the, the chain should not be tied to an individual, it should be tied to the institution and to the process. The other, I think the second thing is about addressing root causes. Uh, if a government does not address the root causes, so here successive governments have been reluctant to address the nature of the state, the what underpins it, the, the values, the ethos, the ideology. Unless you deal with that, I think uh, you will not be able to address uh, any of these uh, issues in a substantive way. And I think finally, it's also about when the international community comes into such a country. And at that time, I think Sri Lanka was like the, um, uh, the, the hope, uh, along with Myanmar at one point, when it, the rest of the world was falling apart. So then there is, I think, a pressure to also show success and which means you are willing to also take crumbs and you do not push as much as you should. Uh, and I think that is a mistake because the international community even now we see is taking that approach to fall, as Pablo said, falling for rhetoric and not pushing. I think those are, I would say, three lessons to, to be learned. Thank you, Amika Bhavani. Thanks, Melissa. I think, uh, look, the speakers have already raised some of the key issues. But in addition, I would say really look at some of the lessons from Sri Lanka. And, uh, and, and unfortunately, we have so many lessons that we need to look at. Look at even just the knee-jerk reaction to appoint commissions of inquiry as a response when there's pressure on accountability. Just what the successive governments, I, I say successive governments keep going back to. So understanding the rhetoric, understanding the fact that these are going to come about, the usual excuses, the delay tactics. But Pablo's point, I think, is so critical. The structural changes. I mean, the culture is definitely necessary, but the structures take decades. 
and work we have done i mean i don't know how to underscore this if you do not have mm -hmm. independent institutions that can investigate that can prosecute and that can stay the course we are just going i mean we also keep doing this in terms of the impunity because i think the whole uh, the group of presentations today shows the scale of violations violence the cycles of violence but if we keep going from one crisis to the other and forget very very basic institutional structures we will have the same conversation in a few years time so while we need to look at international options we also need to build the structures in sri lanka because end of the day we have to start fixing things here um so to have an independent attorney general's department prosecutors these are the same individuals that are getting attacked now political victimization is very real for the individuals who worked on these cases so we need to look at all of these things so it's not i don't say prioritizing everything needs to happen it's long term work that needs to happen and finally the importance that charles raised in terms of the un the un is hand in glove with governments in and in sri lanka they are very involved and i think there has to be responsibility when the un engages as well that it's a principal approach that is it's not the practical pragmatic development focus alone the principal approach and lessons learned in terms of that as well so that is also critical thank you uh bhavani samantharan you wanted a word on this as well uh, just one word Uh, since someone uh, uh, referred to uh, the root causes, and I did say uh, in my earlier presentation as well, a new constitution, new uh, rules of engagement between the peoples who inhabit this island uh, is important. And this government has actually appointed a committee uh, to draft a new constitution, uh, but is in the it's a, it will be in the opposite direction to uh, what we all uh, expect uh, it to move on. so there is a, now another live uh, uh, danger uh, of the constitutional process uh, regressing or going in the opposite direction they have a two thirds majority in parliament and with the right rhetoric they can even uh, get it over uh, at a referendum so uh, while we are looking at progress uh, what we might actually end up uh, with uh, is, is the opposite of that Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Amal Abayawardena from the UK. Uh, there were countless atrocities committed by the LTTE who violated the rights of Tamils that they claimed to represent. There is a lack of confidence in Sri Lanka that these crimes will be investigated or acknowledged by the UN. How can the international community help by investigating human rights violations on all sides, including those committed during the JVP uprisings and the IPKF period? and investigating the role of the supporters of the LTTE who supplied material resources to the tigers when human rights violations were committed. Um Stephen you spoke about uh international uh, justice perhaps you can pick that one up for us. Thank you. Well, I mean I th this is one of the reasons why this uh, mechanism would be very important and and I would note that you know the Dutch had a had a case involving LTTE support and so <laughs> to some extent that's where we've had uh, precedents. Uh, I I would note uh, um that obviously we didn't have of justice uh in any in any significant way about LTTE violations in 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 Sri Lanka albeit by a government that uh, uh that hated the LTTE uh I remember raising this issue with defense secretary uh, uh, Godabaya now president uh, Rajapaksa when I was there and and saying you know we're willing to assist you anything you can do of course recalling that many of the individuals that could have been charged uh, Uh, were in fact according to credible evidence uh, uh killed uh, after surrender and numbers of around 360 that are that are given out so the number of suspects uh, uh for violations that may have occurred in the conflict zone uh, wasn't there and i remember uh, uh uh the defense secretary saying oh trials trials you know they get they go on so long and people get off and then and then he said uh, i killed them i killed them i killed them uh you know that's that's not uh, that's not justice 
justice is when you hear about the, the evidence, when victims are able to come forth and talk about their children being abducted. It's supposedly one child would be taken uh, for the LTD. In many cases, multiple uh, children were, were taken. And these were horrors. And we had uh, attacks on, on buses and uh, the use of, of, of suicide bombers, et cetera. Some of the some of the things that uh, uh, that happened in the rest of the world, child soldiers, suicide bombers, uh, in, in a sense, uh, 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 came to us uh, uh, from Sri Lanka. So it's important to have justice on both sides, on all sides. And, 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 uh, and indeed, that could still happen on the island. We, instead, we have things like the Prevention of Terrorism Act and an emphasis uh, on sort of a, saying someone's uh, uh, associated on one side or another or digging out evidence uh, of, of, of someone's uh, political connections, et cetera, not on, on the conduct. And what you fundamentally need, and this is so important even as we deal with terrorism prosecutions in the West, is, is conduct, <laughs> the, 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 the murder of innocents, uh, the, the sexual slavery, the torture, the other things that, that sometimes occur uh, from, from non-state actors. This is what needs to be presented, as it certainly does from the point of view of, of state actors. Of course, the, the state actors <laughs> that were involved in these crimes uh, that have been identified and mentioned and that we're familiar with uh, haven't been prosecuted and some went on to commit other offenses uh, uh, and, and to engage in acts of corruption and and that clearly sends a bad signal so that justice needs to be to be even handed uh, and, and needs to be uh, uh, done uh, fairly and and of course at the international level often it'll depend on whether in a particular country there's a target over which they have jurisdiction so that's the imperfect way to do it the far better way would have been uh, the, the recommendation uh, that the government subscribed to in, in resolution 30 slash one to have a to have a court uh, uh, with international presence that would have given credibility. I recall in other places where uh, where the you know for instance in Bosnia where we had a state court uh, and it had people from each of the three communities, but initially uh, people from the international community and victims were much more confident at least at the beginning when they saw someone from the international community because they said, well this is a person that's a partisan here. And, and so it does, uh, uh, even though in the end, I think the, the domestic uh, participants did a fantastic job there. It, it, it aids that perception of independence. And, and it's so tragic that, uh, that this wasn't taken up, uh, that it wasn't implemented, uh, that, that nothing really uh, happened in that regard, even, even under this uh, coalition uh, government that we had uh, uh, during the, the period between uh, uh, 2015 and, and 2019. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Ambika? Thank you, Melissa. I mean, I agree with Mr. Rapp about um, that uh, justice has to be even handed and we have to investigate all violations. Uh, we don't, I don't think it, we disagree on that. Uh, but I would like to just point out two things is that one is that the UN, when uh, I think Radhika Kumaraswamy was the UN special representative on children in armed conflict, it was there were several reports that were that she presented to the council about recruitment of child soldiers by the LTPE. So I think to say that the UN is in denial is counterfactual. Uh, the second point is in relation to how the government views accountability. So for now, if you're talking about violations committed, there are two persons uh, in the current government who committed those, are alleged to have committed those violations, including the massacre of 600 policemen, uh, abduction of children, extrajudicial killings, and forced disappearances. So if the government is actually serious about accountability, why doesn't it stop there? Why doesn't it prosecute them? Then when we ask that question, what, what the answer that we get is that, um, well, you know, they helped us defeat the LTTE. So is that how accountability is supposed to work? Is that how justice is supposed to work? If you help us, it doesn't matter what you did in the past. We wipe the slate clean. But if you are against us, then God forbid, we will use all ammunition to come after you. Thank you, Ambika. And Pablo? Just uh, very briefly, I mean, I think that the, uh, in my brief intervention, I talked about the fact that, that the very project of human rights uh, in Sri Lanka is one that is seen as a serious sum game and of interest to just one community. And this is, of course, one of the things that has to be overcome. 
one of the manifestations of which is the lack of even-handedness in uh, the administration of justice. So I think that it is absolutely critical for the institutions to send the message that the only criterion that is sufficient, in fact, to trigger the operation of, for example, the criminal justice system is the violation of a right, of a fundamental right, independently of all other considerations, including uh, uh, membership in a community, ethnicity, religion, or whatever. We are talking about the rights of all Sri Lankans. And unless the institutions commit themselves to realizing that idea, I think that we're going to be talking about uh, these issues again and again. Bhavani made uh, the very important point, I think, that Sri Lankan institutions rely for good governance on the great virtue of particular individuals. But that means that the institutions, in fact, are extraordinarily weak, that they perform only on the initiative of people who have great virtue. This is not the way that a country secures the rights of citizens, and it is typically a problem that has been overcome by middle-income countries such as Sri Lanka, which have institutions in which, for example, prosecutions and investigations are carried out ex officio, not because of the initiative of particularly courageous individuals. And of course, I am praising them, but I am saying the country cannot rely simply on the fact that there are some people with heroic dispositions in their midst. It needs real institutions and an understanding of human rights as the embodiment of generalizable interests, not the interest of one particular community. Thank you, Pablo. Um, I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to move us on to the next question. Although if panelists want to come in on previous questions that they haven't been able to comment on, please do so in your answers. Um, so we have a question from Anandaraj Panambalam from the U USA. Um, when Sri Lanka refuses to adhere to human rights for segments of its population, how can you say that the solution should be from within Sri Lanka? Um, I wonder, Bhavani, if you could comment on that, because you've spoken a little bit about institution building within Sri Lanka and the importance of that. Thank you, Melissa. You know, I think when listening to panels such as this, and there's been a few, you realise the scale of violence and violations and it's not a new thing so it's it cycles no? and we um and we get heartened when there are small windows where we can make some progress and we get excited and i think for those in sri lanka who've been doing this for so long and some of some in the panel have done it for much longer than me we we try to see the positives um and at least say okay there are some windows I still think there are still windows in Sri Lanka. As a Sri Lankan working here, I think we need to have that optimism. But yeah. I think what many of us have said is that space is shrinking very, very fast. And if steps are not taken now within Sri Lanka, but with the support of the international community, I think what we miss amidst this rhetoric at this moment is it's seen as this international community is against us, against Sri Lanka. And if you look at what has been happening over the years, it's to support Sri Lanka. It's to support Sri Lankans get to address reconciliation, to address human rights. The unfortunate thing that we've also spoken about is the immense challenges and the structures that keep pushing back. The racism, the ethno-nationalism, it's there. We are not denying that. But the fact that 2015 and for a few years we had a few opportunities mean mm -hmm. I'm optimistic that we can get there. But it's going to be a much harder road. And I think one lesson, if anything, we can learn from the more recent exercises, we all need to be better prepared. 
we all need to start building those blocks even though we are revisiting some of these conversations now what shreen alluded to in terms of what happened last week in the northern east is something we need to really factor in that people muslims and tamils spontaneously many spontaneously came out and walked despite the numerous challenges thrown at them this was 50000 or more let's not get stuck in the numbers people walked because they feel they needed to walk the space is shrinking so fast that they need to get out and do it i think there are some other things that are happening i mean maybe not as large as that but there are conversations happening there are people going to court there are people despite the covid regulations people make statements find different ways of challenging countering having that narrative so i want to say that yes it looks gloomy um but let's also look at this as a long term it's not just march the council and it's over it's not what happens to the, the next day after the march session is over what happens then it's the sri lankans who have to deal with it and who will be there then to talk about it and take those challenges forward so yes it looks dire but i want to raise this very pertinent question we are having a special presidential commission of inquiry that is already sitting and going to target 20 odd individuals or possibly more mr sumandiran is one of them there are others they are going to gut the investigations go after prosecutors go after those who genuinely work towards accountability transparency what is it that we're going to do in sri lanka because i think these are hard questions that goes beyond the mat session so um just to say that i think we need to keep the resilience the optimism all of that but it doesn't end in the next few weeks it doesn't end after march it's a long struggle forward thank you uh bavani Um, we have a question here from Saroj Pathirana, um, who's a journalist, uh, commenting on the continued detention of lawyer Hajaz Hisbullah and the use of the PTA in general. Baroness Kennedy, the director of IBARI, insisted the due process doesn't seem to be adhered to. She has also expressed concern about the arrest of a senior detective, Shani Abesekara, who has been investigating serious crime in Sri Lanka. She says that she would like to be persuaded that Sri Lanka is not following a pattern of actually incarcerating people because they don't like them. Um what are your views on that? Do you have a comment on on her uh intervention? Who would like to take that? Uh may I uh, uh, go ahead Shreen. Okay. Uh so this is a continuing um, uh, uh spectacle that we see uh of targeting uh, uh persons who stand up uh hijas iskulla is a, a, a big example in this uh, no charges yet uh, uh, and not being produced before a judge uh, for so long uh, and despite all the pressure uh, the government is just sitting it out and uh, want to make a spectacle of him uh, so that others uh, you know chill and will not uh, uh, do anything uh, same thing about uh, uh, the poet uh, there was one other uh, ramzi razik who wrote something uh, unfortunately he is now out on bail uh, but this young poet from mana uh, who actually wrote against extremism and they say he is uh, uh, inciting extremism and that uh so so they are targeting uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, thing and also what is worse is that uh, during the last government the prosecutors bavani mentioned that the prosecutors and others who work diligently on uh, cases uh, and and try to take accountability forward are themselves being targeted now 
uh, by these uh, presidential uh, commissions uh, and they are going to be prosecuted for politically victimizing uh, these offenders uh, so uh, the shrinking space i mean it, it's an understatement to say that the, that the space is shrinking uh, uh, we are we are sitting uh, uh, in a in a space uh, where we can't uh, even uh, you know stretch our feet or uh, expand our elbows or anything like that uh, tight uh, and and like this uh, and very soon there'll be a, a plaster put across uh, our mouths as well thank you Sri. Uh, I just want to add uh, some of the cases uh, um, Honorable Sumandran spoke about uh, the, you know, featured cases. But uh, to my knowledge, from November, the memorialization process, uh, uh, my count is over 48 people have been detained under PTA. Unknown. People are not even aware. They, their cases have not come out to the surface, including somebody from the local authority just writing a poem saying, uh, remembering the one of the martyr. Uh, so, uh, so this is something that we need to carefully look at it. How Sri Lankan government has been using PTA in in in, in large scale uh, to arrest anybody, uh, you know, uh, and also like uh, you know some of the the you know even though the mothers have been not been arrested or like thrown, I know this P two P time one of the mothers' son has been taken briefly uh, under custody. Another mother has got seventeen court orders. 70 court orders and another mother has a military checkpoint set up next to her house so that much of surveillance whether she is thrown into the prison or the prison the military surveillance thing is uh, somewhat similar so these are things that we need to think about what is happening thank you thank you Shreen. uh the next question comes from uh shimindra fernando from uh sri lanka um, and uh, his question is, can the panelists explain why the UN confidentiality clause prevented verification of all allegations until 2031 and why the UN report prepared with the support of the ICRC and Vani based NGOs was not considered? This, this question is obviously quite detailed um, and goes into some detail. Uh, I, I think it's about um, the, obviously the Sri Lankan government has repeatedly denied uh, that war crimes took place uh, towards the end of the war and, uh, you know, in the war, during the war. Um, do any of the panellists have a comment on the Sri Lankan government narrative about uh, the war crimes um, during during the Sri Lankan civil war? Well, I, I could ju I, I can jump in. I mean, uh, uh, frankly, I mean, the uh, position of, of this government and a previous government is totally lacking in, in, in credibility. Uh, uh, you know, even as I noted, uh, um, you know, the, in the LLRC report, they indicated that there were six incidents in which civilians yeah. were killed that called for investigation. Of course, there were far, far more than that. And, and one gets into numbers ga games or disputes and it's impossible to calculate, but, but certainly, uh, you know, I've talked to people like the Bishop of Monar, who uh, uh, calculates more than 100,000 people uh, being killed uh, during during the final uh, period of the conflict when people were in these no-fire zones uh, being torn torn to pieces. Uh, but certainly tens of thousands uh, were killed and are, are, are no longer there. And, uh, and, and there's never been any acceptance of responsibility, even an acknowledgement of it, even a sort of statement that this was collateral damage and that these were justified or anything like that. It's sometimes they say it was a zero casualty operation, which is, which, which is ludicrous. Uh, but, you know, uh, I, in, in, and certainly in terms of the laws of armed conflict of, of IHL, there were clear violations and there was certainly deprivation of humanitarian assistance uh, with, within that area, things that have been documented before. Uh, but then we've got the, the cold-blooded killings at the end of the conflict, and senior officials are, are, are involved. Uh, and uh, and it's one of the reasons why this uh, missing persons process always becomes so opaque, because obviously the numbers don't add up. <laughs> if they started actually dealing with what happened to this person, this person, this person, and dug into it, of course, it would point to, uh, straight to the top. And so uh, the, the whole process is, uh, uh, has, has lacked uh, credibility. Uh, um, occasionally you get, uh, and certainly from people like Fonseca, uh, from 
General Sonseca, et cetera, acknowledgement of the brutality of the conflict, et, et, et cetera, while uh, raising issues about the white flag killings that he wasn't responsible for. Uh, but uh, but uh, it, it's lacked uh, credibility and, uh, uh, and, and continues uh, to do so. And, and it just, it's, it's why it's so, um, so why this international community needs to continue to be engaged. Now you talk about, you know, the, uh, the ICRC, and of course, uh, uh, they were present sometimes, though they were denied uh, access uh, to the detention uh, camps. They, they had the ability to, to deal with people that had actually been put into judicial proceedings. But of course, their whole uh, practice is to maintain confidentiality and the hope uh, that they can uh, have access and the hope that they can uh, further uh, uh, compliance. And, and so we have to work with that. But, but certainly uh, credible in investigations uh, that have been conducted, including uh, uh, information from satellite uh, photography and, and other things, uh, you know, make it clear that serious violations occurred for which there has been zero accountability. And that leaves aside the white flag, I mean, excuse me, the um, the white flag, but the white van abductions, the other emblematic cases, the violations in, in the rest of the country, the ongoing impunity. Uh, it is uh, it is an outrageous uh, situation, and and then of course when you do have these incidents that happen in plain sight and somebody's finally convicted, uh, you, you have, a, have a presidential party. Uh, I, I I do want to note, you know, as an American and as someone that, that very happy that the United States will return to engagement at the, at the Human Rights Council, that, that every country has challenges. We've seen the fragility of our own democracy. Uh, you know, uh, we all have to uh, recognize that we have responsibilities in our own country uh, to confront situations where our own systems uh, turn out to be insufficiently robust when it comes to holding individuals to account, when things become highly politicized or tribalized in a way. And, and, and that's... Uh, it's it's not just the Sri Lanka, but here you've had these horrendous violations and 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 nothing done, and and, and governments actually elected to, on on a, on a campaign of impunity, and and now conducting uh, this obstruction of justice process, going after the honest people. I mean, I've I've talked to police officers who discussed how they were really engaged with the families and these people, and they, they really were going to do something, and and indeed they end up being. Uh, uh, being attacked uh, for, for doing their jobs. And, and mm -hmm. some of that gives me hope. I mean, I, there are windows there, but this government wants to close every, every, every one of, of those windows. And, and all we can do from the international community is to uh, signal support for people in, in Sri Lanka and do what we can from the outside to, to basically send the message that we're not gonna rest. This is not gonna be closed. There's yeah. gonna be every avenue used uh, there's no normalization. There's no turn the page and forget about it. No, we're gonna we're gonna be on this, and and I think that's what's required of all of us. But of course, as as we deal with problems in our own country and and, and elsewhere, we want to partner with the people who have suffered from these violations in, in Sri Lanka. Thank you, Stephen. I'm going to come to Charles next, please. Yeah, I guess the the, the confidentiality issue. I'm I'm not very, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to to address, but. But following up what Stephen said, that actually there's a lot of documentation on what happened. Uh, I'm, I saw uh, a lot of it. I think we've all seen a lot of it. Uh, uh, there was that, that independent investigation before the, the panel that uh, actually it's the reason why uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon set up the panel, the in internal panel, was because of the independent investigation. So there is a lot of documentation that, it, that, that exists, which reinforces the importance of continuing to document. I, I think, I don't know if it was Pablo or, or Stephen who was saying that you need to be able to continue document to, to document in order to be ready when the moment comes when, when uh, something can be done. I, I think the last thing in terms of documentation and in terms of the, the UN, the UN actually lived through the no fire zone. You you have the story of the eleventh convoy, convoy eleven that, that was, I would suggest, was actually used as bait for the establishment of a no fire zone. So 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 not only is there documentation in terms of interviews that were done from victims, but there's also documentation in terms of what the UN lived through, and UN personnel lived through, and how they documented it in, internally. So so I think there's absolutely no question about what happened in uh, in the pocket. It just hasn't been 
dealt with. But, but the, the, the information, I mean, the, the proof is there. Thank you, Charles. Um, I'm going to come to one final question. Unfortunately, we do have a lot of questions and a lot of interest. So thanks to the audience for, for engaging with us. Um, but we're going to have one final question before we come to uh, final remarks from the panelists uh, just in the interest of time. Um, so the final question uh, is from the USA. Um, just like the apartheid regime in South Africa, uh, the Rajapaksa regime will only respond to an economic boycott. Uh, will the world understand that and go for it? Uh, Stephen, you, you commented earlier on economic uh, sanctions and so on. Yeah, yeah and, and, and indeed, uh, we are in, in an era where, 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 where we want to be smarter about our sanctions, uh, though I do think it's important that people remember that the, the world uh, coming together on apartheid in South Africa uh, had an impact and the fact that we even had a, uh, sanctions adopted in the U.S. over a presidential veto, I think, was was, was quite important. So, so sometimes you need to, to do those kinds of things. Obviously, to the extent that you can target uh, this at the perpetrators and limit their ability to use foreign financial uh, institutions, uh, in, indeed, and in, in, and uh, and and travel bans and, and and everything else, and the sort of message that when you get out there, you might be prosecuted. Uh, uh, that's an extremely important message. But but I do think that uh, that. Um, the idea of development is normal or trade is normal. We've had, of course, during the earlier period, uh, the, the GSP plus, uh, uh, you know, preference uh, for uh, uh, textiles coming from uh, Sri Lanka, that that's really a kind of reward that should only be there uh, for a country that's 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 observing uh, the relevant standards. Those things are important. It needs, it needs to hurt. Uh, and, uh, and certainly when it comes to the IFIs, as we call them, the international financial institutions. And I know in my own government, there's real reluctance to use those tools or the votes that the U.S. has. But several times our Congress has passed uh, uh, laws that <laughs> require the U.S. to vote in a particular way. And, uh, and, and so, uh, um, you know, there, uh, people can go to their own parliaments in, in Europe or in America and say, uh, uh, we shouldn't vote this particular way until we have one, two, three. And, and with clear conditions and reasonable ones. But uh, obviously, if you're talking about development, it needs to be balanced. It needs to be, in, you, you need to have the rule of law. If you don't have the rule of law, anything you built can be torn down the next day. So, you know, it's it's crazy to think you can develop uh, on, on a rotten foundation, to be frank. And, and I think that that's the message that clearly has to be uh, uh, in the minds of people that are engaged in development and, and trade and, and everything else, that there should be uh, conditions and, uh, and, and that that's one of the ways in which you can have an impact. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Fais, would you like to come in on this one? Well, as spoken or as adverted to earlier, <clears throat> uh, I mean, yeah, respond, um, echoing what uh, <clears throat> Ambassador Rapp said, you know, we need to be smart on sanctions. And then, you know, we have also built up the current entire population on rhetorics and pseudo slogans. So uh, targeting uh, uh, targeting sanctions to the country as a whole may not be the right thing to go as, as a first startup thing. So as, as the High Commissioner had pointed out, we need to work on classif uh, clarified individual um, sanctions. You know, as, as Mr. Sumandra and Edward, the two travel bans, as uh, would be the start, thing to start, and of course, individual uh, apl application of junior, universal jurisdiction to individuals who have been uh, credibly identified with um, violations uh, would be would be a way to go. And then, you know, we have also felt already, um, rightly or wrongly, um, the, the travel sanction on the current army commander is hurting, and then that is making people to think about it. So, I think. Uh, to limit it to individual um, sanctions as as recommended or as, as going to be recommended in the, as mentioned in the uh, High Commissioner's <coughs> report to the sessions would be the way to go and not not target the country as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Fives. Um, okay, uh, we are now running um, nine minutes over. So thank you to, to all of our panelists for uh, extending the time for us. Um, I just want to come to closing remarks from, from each of our panelists. Uh, if you could keep them short, please, that would be great. Um, and I'm going to do that in the opposite order from which you spoke. Um, so I'll come to Samantha Ann first, please. Uh, thank you, Melissa. 
thank you everyone uh, who uh, uh, gave your comments and those who participated and asked questions as well. Uh, as we have already said, uh, we are uh, living with very hard times and uh, looking at a very big future as well. Uh, so, at, it is at this point in time that the uh, session, that the Fox Fox session of the UN Health Council happens. And what happens there is of uh, enormous importance because that sends uh, signals uh, whether or not uh, uh, it is uh, uh, binding on the country. Uh, signals are very important. Uh, and so uh, I think uh, we need to work on a very strong resolution. Uh, uh, coming out of the uh, UN Human Rights Council uh, at this session. Secondly, uh, sanctions, uh, I was going to say something at the last question. Uh, individual targeted uh, sanctions uh, uh, work very well. Uh, and uh, since the High Commissioner has now, I think uh, even previously it has been mentioned, uh, and this time she has pressed it hard, uh, and I, I'd like to see something in the resolution uh, with regard to that as well, encouraging member states uh, to take on themselves uh, and, and, and take this forward. Uh, and thirdly, uh, on accountability, uh, whether uh, there can be a serious effort uh, taken uh, to take the perpetrators to the International uh, Criminal Court, however uh, difficult the path may be. Uh, uh, can we start uh, uh, on that process? And fourth and finally, uh, uh, the guarantee of non-recurrence, as I said twice before, uh, international community needs to come in uh, on the discussion uh, of the new rules of engagement and that is a new constitution so that there is a fresh uh, uh, social contract that is established for uh, the future for all Thank you. Uh, Shreen? Uh, so I want to reiterate a strong uh, resolution, particularly focusing on accountability in the forthcoming Geneva session. Um, uh, particularly, I mean, one of the things that High Commissioner has talked about is, is this, um, you know, extraterritorial and international jurisdiction. So that need to be carefully looked at it and also somehow preserve the evidence that is already being halfway through in the destruction process. Uh, the second one, again, I'm going to reiterate uh, the High Commissioner's uh, new mandate uh, to prevent uh, conflict. As women of this country, we have seen enough. And this, uh, there is a, 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 a kind of a religious conflict brewing in this country. And we have already had 30 years long conflict, uh, a bloody end to it. And we don't want another conflict. So she has to take that mandate of uh, October 2020 resolution of 40 slash 31 and take the early warning sign that we are, uh, you know, uh, giving, uh, you know, giving now and make sure that she uh, raise Sri Lanka on uh, socially organizing intercessional briefing to uh, the Human Rights uh, Council and also the special mandate holders to keep pushing Sri Lanka uh, with regard to their recommendation, particularly uh, uh, forthcoming UPR session and other sessions to keep Sri Lanka focused. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Stephen? Yes, I, I, I would like to underline that recommendation for the for the dedicated capacity and uh, of course, the UN has done some great work here with the panel of experts and with the uh, OISL uh, investigation. Though I know myself from from dealing with prosecution at the at the other end of this and working with national prosecutors, quite often when they turn to the UN and they ask for the information, they say, "Well, the witnesses didn't get conformed consent. We've got nobody to go back and check. Uh, you know, there uh, there isn't a lot sometimes of assistance available." and and a mechanism like this would allow the witnesses to be uh, spoken to, would allow videos, including the videos taken by soldiers themselves of some of these horrors, uh, to be verified with the modern technology that can eliminate the fakes and, and determine whether they're real. And, and to really build the dossiers uh, in ways that when there was an opportunity in a third country or hopefully an opportunity in the future, that evidence will be there in a verifiable way. And. Uh, and I and that's something we can do now. And if we don't have this, it, it won't happen. And and then uh, and then the 
it won't be there when there's that opportunity for justice. So it's something that we can do now. It's not as good as the Syria or Myanmar one. It's going to be much smaller, but it's a step in the right direction. Thank you. Ambika? Yeah, I'm muting myself. Um, yes, just to say, I mean, uh, what we have is a culture of denial here. There's institutions are dysfunctional and there is a lack of trust. The citizens, particularly the Tamil and Muslim communities, don't trust the state and especially not this government. The problem is that the government doesn't seem to care about these communities. So how can we believe the government when it says it will deal with the past? The worrying factor is that even the opposition is still speaking of domestic accountability mechanisms. And the leader of the opposition was critical of the travel ban against the army commander. So while agreeing that change does have to come within Sri Lanka, yes, we Sri Lankans are responsible for it. But we do need international pressure and involvement to bring about changes within Sri Lanka. If not, successive governments that do not even acknowledge there was an ethnic conflict which to date, uh, the root causes of which have not been addressed, are not going to address these root causes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Faiz? Reiterating the need for a resolution to address the issues meaningfully, uh, and also reiterate that the, the pressure does uh, impact, although there are rhetoric about we don't care about the UN, we don't care about the resolution and things like that. We just saw a couple of days ago uh, on the eve of um, Pakistani Prime Minister's impending arrival, no person, no other, no lesser person than the Prime Minister himself getting up in Parliament and saying things that he could not even keep up or his office that couldn't keep up. So pressure does work in a way, but then Taking on from there is, amongst other things, is that we also need to figure out amongst uh, <clears throat> Sri Lankans ourselves, like Ambika said, you know, the opposition also plays to the gallery and keeps misleading the masses, the, the majority of the masses, without informing them of the truth. So dissemination of the truth and what needs to be done in, in country to um, to treat or to our culture to evolve that every, every citizen every member of every community would be treated equally is also a thing that we need to explore and uh, invest our energies on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bhavani? I think everyone said uh, the key points. Look, a, re a robust resolution, critical, a strong OHCHR presence, member states taking very specific Steps. I personally think the High Commissioner's report is excellent in terms of the recommendations. That's key. It's a good starting point. There are many others that have been looked at. You, I would say universal jurisdiction, all of that. The pressure points are key. But I keep coming back to Sri Lanka, within Sri Lanka. What is it that we can build towards? What do we do after the session is over? And in that, I mean, there's been a lot of worrying things we've discussed, but I think there's also, I want to end on a positive note in terms of the resilience of the Sri Lankans, the resilience we have seen for decades. And even despite the darkest days, there's been things that we have been able to get through. So I think my colleagues, most of the colleagues here have been very active on the ground. And I think we need to look at those opportunities. So in that, the conversation needs to be, yes, Geneva is important. We all, I think, want Geneva to continue as a pressure point. But in the long term, in terms of the systematic structural issues, in terms of the racism, in terms of the militarization and the impunity, it's us that we need to do the work here. So I think in that we need the support from the international community, those in the panel, but also those listening in terms of reaching out and helping us in the next phase, which is dark, which is difficult, which is possibly impossible, sometimes impossible, but I feel maybe I'm the naive optimist, but I think there are things we need to start building right now. And I would like to end that. Thank you, Bhavani. Uh, Pablo? 
Thank you very much. Uh, really, uh, everyone's intervention uh, uh, includes uh, things that I agree with uh, emphatically, so there is uh, little to say. I just want to reiterate, uh, like many countries that have known uh, conflict, uh, one of the best sad things uh, about this is that it leaves in its wake uh, a great deal of mistrust and the inability to coordinate and the inability to plan strategically. So I want to echo Babani's emphasis on the importance of this sort of internal coordination. However, also with Stephen and with Shreen, who has mentioned the resolutions emphasizing the preventive role of the Council and of other UN institutions, I also want to say the international community has its own problems uh, thinking strategically and coordinating its support uh, for Sri Lanka. And both levels of strategic thinking and coordination are necessary now, the national and the international. Thank you, Pablo. And finally, Charles? I, I guess I, I just want to pick up what Bhavani said, which is, that we from the outside need to honor and understand that the, that there are dynamics in Sri Lanka. There are people in Sri Lanka that are dealing every day with what they have to, what they're subjected to, and and they're finding ways to to uh, to serve. Well, more, more than survive, they're they're finding ways to deal with life, and that's and what we need to do is to get the UN to become a total partner in this. And, uh, and, and what, what I'd like to say is, is that the UN has learned lessons, I, I think, however much, you know, that, that in a sense, you can say that the UN can no longer justify by saying we don't have the structures to do it. They've learned the lessons, they've understood the commitment. What they lack right now is the courage. There's some very good people in the system. They're very good people in Colombo and elsewhere who really want to do the right thing, but the institution lacks courage. And that's why my advice to the Sri Lankan people is don't count on the UN because you may be disappointed. While if the UN, if you don't count on the UN and you count on your own resilience and the UN actually turns out to perform, that will be such an unexpected win. <laughs> so for me, don't, don't build a strategy on the UN performing, but those of us who are on the outside see absolutely no justification for the UN not performing. Thank you, Charles. Um, and thank you to all of the speakers for, for those closing remarks and for being extremely generous with your time. We are uh, 20 minutes over. So um, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up very quickly. Uh, thanks again to the audience, to everyone who's joined us from all around the world for your attention, for your questions and for your engagement with the subject. Um, we hope that will continue. Um, and thank you to our co-hosts, the Centre for Human Rights and Global Justice at NYU, uh, Global Tamil Forum and Canadian Tamil Congress. Um, so that's everything for today. Um, thank you all and uh, best wishes with all of your work in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.